What is up all? I'm just going to go ahead and take this and put it here because this is an intense episode, one in which we dive deep. Intense, for my reasoning, we're almost 100 episodes in, and this conversation encompasses business, technology, the future of different technologies to come. Amazing, amazing journey for Jason Mars in all of his life story, growing up in Guyana, South America, coming to America, learning and discovering that he enjoys academia, enjoys research, enjoys tech, enjoys building, and then to build an amazing company, and that being Clink, that was fostered out of Clarity Lab in University of Michigan, where he's a professor out of, still is, um, grew it tremendously, learned so much from that, went on from that to now building even more amazing things and building new code to build more amazing products. There is so much in this episode, so I hope you enjoy it. And truly, truly check out Jason's work. I have all the links in the description. Something you'll really want to look into. Enjoy. I have a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Jason, I'm glad we are here. You're you, when I talked to you before, there are so many things I wrote down. I was like, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about this. So it's really nice to have you here, just like openly discussing your life, but also the insights into business things, tech things, other stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's it's delightful. Thank you so much for having me. Um, looking forward to chatting. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So I know that uh, I have friends who grew up in africa and they have just such interesting stories first time being in america first generation going to university where i met them but for you you said you grew up in guyana africa um so oh, south america south america yeah guyana south america yeah yeah, yeah. it's um oh. it's right next to venezuela it's uh <clears throat> so i was born in jamaica oh, my mom wow. was us yeah 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 yeah, my, yeah, my mom was studying at uh, University of West Indies <clears throat> when when I was born, um, and I grew up in Guyana. But my, both my parents are Guyanese, uh, and that's in the Caribbean, right? It's uh, it's right on, right next to Venezuela, basically. Got it, got it, got it. Yeah. That's yeah. a beautiful, that's a beautiful country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. but I learned something new today, which is why I love these conversations. But <laughs> in in saying that, I wanted to know how long did you grow up there, in Guyana, South America? Yeah, so uh, I was there till I was around seven or eight. Um, okay. You know, so I was in Jamaica as a baby, um, and then uh, lived in Guyana since then till I was seven or eight. And that's when my dad and mom uh, emigrated to the United States <clears throat> from from Guyana. <clears throat> yeah, I want to I want to know what growing up in hindsight now. I mean, you're you're way older. You're in America. Mm -hmm. You've done amazing things. Mm -hmm. What has growing up there taught you now that you see in hindsight, like the things you got exposed to? You said it was like a sort of island off the coast, almost like. Just yeah. completely different lifestyle. Um, love oh, that. absolutely. And it, it's, a, it's a completely different kind of socioeconomic situation. Um, and there's a number of cultural differences, right? Like, so, so in the Caribbean, in many of the Caribbean countries, right? Like Haiti, Trinidad, Guyana, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of poverty. Well, you know, mm. uh, and poverty is really, uh, you know, what was it? It's a state of mind, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of um, the GDP per capita is incredibly low compared to what we're used to in the Western world or, or you know, Europe, et cetera. So it was definitely a different life experience. And, and you know, um, really there is a common narrative that the only way to prosperity is through education. At least that's what my parents ingrained in me ever since I, mm. you know, could remember things. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I'd, we didn't have a lot. We scrimped and scrounged. When we came to the U.S., we, we landed in uh, New York City for a while. I lived in Queens, Queens New York. Um, you know, my mom worked at CVS. 
<laughs> you know, she got a job. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if she was like, had the right kind of visa for it, but she, like her sister hooked her up with somebody that was able to get her the job. Um, my dad, he's always been an academician, right? So he was a professor at University of Guyana. And so he, he was pursuing um, academic positions in the US uh, when, I, when we came over. He, he ultimately landed at Wayne State University in Detroit. Um, and actually that's how I ended up moving to Michigan the first time, right? So I moved to Detroit, lived there for a few years from Queens, New York, and then, um, and then to the suburbs, Southfield. Um, you know, it was like, it's, it's fascinating, right? Cause, uh, Detroit's interesting. You've got the center. When I arrived, it was like, Detroit was black city. You got mm-hmm. the center of the blackness. And then on the periphery of the blackness, you had f- places like Southfield, Southfield, Lathrop Village, right? These are, and then you go like one mile, you know, you, you cross 12 mile, 13 mile, you hit 14 mile, and then it's like completely white. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a very strange thing. But um, so, so we moved to the to nicer suburbs. Um, uh, and, you know, that's kind of where I grew up. But um, but it, it my my upbringing was was very different than you know your typical uh, journey, in that <clears throat> I was poor, mm. um, but I was I was kind of trained early on that um, prosperity only comes through achievement, and it's like in every waking moment it's like. Are you working on achieving things academically? <laughs> you know what I mean? Are you doing what you're supposed to be doing as a human being? Right? That's that's the brainwashing I got as a kid. Yeah. Well, uh, so, yeah. Though on that point, I, I had a question of like your, your parents being, uh, I know your, your mom ended up teaching too as well. So like your parents both teaching, right? So yep. professors at university. Yep. Mm-hmm. Your, your professor at University of Michigan now, like did that influence you to end up uh, teaching or is it just like in you that ac- academia was the way and like I just want to spread this and you know, be, be a part of it dude actually not at all like <laughs> their journey did not influence like let me, <laughs> let me tell you how this worked so my mom like she was a lawyer in Guyana right she was a, actually a very oh, wow. successful lawyer so when we came over um my dad got into Wayne you know became a professor at Wayne State Wayne State had the 50 percent program where you you pay less to go to school my mom got her PhD at Wayne State University, right, uh, in that program, uh, in sociology, uh, criminal justice as a focus. And then they were just, they're humanities type professors, right? They're like Karl Marxian philosopher type, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, um, a- uh, academicians, which is very different than the engineering sciences. Now, my journey never had an interest in academia. I, you know, it just sounded quite you know, on, mm. on enthralling, let's say. Um, but so I was always a tinkerer. Like my dream as a kid was to, I, I was coding very early. I started coding when I was like 15. And my dream was to create novel code. I mean, at, at one point, <laughs> uh, when I was in high school, I created this pseudo company called Extreme and Intelligent Code, XIC, sick. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was just this... And I, I would watch Pirates of Silicon Valley over and over and over. And I'm like, mm. dude, that shit's going to be me, dude. Like, I'm going to be like Jobs. I'm going to be like Gates. I'm going to create something amazing and like do big shit. And then, you know, I actually wasn't even planning to go to college. Like, if it was up to me, I wouldn't have gone to college if my parents didn't threaten to threaten serious, you know, violence to me <laughs> if I didn't go to college. So I went to college really to appease the demands and obligations uh, I thought I had to my parents. Um, and then along the way, I discovered academic research. I actually didn't really appreciate or understand what it is, but I discovered it. Uh, and I recognized that it's a it's a place where you can tinker and create unencumbered by like a boss. Like it's, it's really crazy. You, you can get a PhD and then you can research what, it, let's say you become a professor, you can research whatever you think matters, work on that, publish it, convince other people that it's cool. And that's how success works. And you can just make your life all about that. And 
Mm. When I discovered that as a sophomore slash junior uh, in college, I was like, oh, well, that's that's interesting. I can do that until I discover something really impactful, a big contribution to the world that I can create that impact, greatness with, right? So, so that's actually my pathway to academia. Um, I'm sure in my subconscious, it, it was a thing, you know, because of course they, they love their jobs and they praised it all the time. Uh, and so maybe in my subconscious, I was like, oh, professor, is this a very awesome thing to be? Mm-hmm. But it, it definitely wasn't, I mean, my pathway to it was very, uh, it felt like my own discovery uh, when I was in college. Inter- it's an interesting reason too. It's like, the your curiosity is the thing you never want to have die it's like the wick that keeps the candle going right so that's amazing to hear and i i I was gonna ask this question a little bit later but it's very time that i ask it now is you said at one point you were working on three uh papers at once um and you published over like 30 papers for uh what was it your research for that year as you were a professor and just like you said doing research and and having fun and kind of getting paid to do it in a way how how do you manage such a thing like i know in this bookshelf over here uh deep work by cal newport is on there right he's big on deep work he was able he's a big professor he was able to publish multiple papers um but how did you how did like can you explain that to me to the lay person yeah 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 i mean you know there's something i'm really proud of is is um early in my uh, academic career as a professor i was able to be quite productive you know um so i was able to publish a lot of high quality uh and what i would call myself i would say it's creative work or like mm-hmm. high quality high novelty work um so you know, I developed a lot of observations. You see, even even the the institution of 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 create of of creating itself, right, or or the um, the uh, kind of the the, in, the institutional system of academic research. Um, you know, I I didn't. I, w- I was never much of a follower, right? So there's a lot of kind of standard approaches to how you, you know, operationalize your research program. And, um, my, you know, my research program, I, I, I experimented with innovating with the, the, you know, the process of producing research and, um, and systematizing it. And I made a couple observations. Um, you know, a lot of it is, the, the academic community is a market and ideas are the product and and the quality of the product is the execution the rigor and the scholarly nature of how you execute your work and so to do high quality work um you have to really understand what the bar is for rigor in its execution and so i systematically study that and the the work is out there it's all execution of it yeah like how you execute it and and then i also systematically studied the how the market works i actually would look at proceedings like i would look at journals and i would study what what fractions of papers cover what topics over time to understand this market almost a as an economist a macroeconomics kind of view of academic research, right? Um, Looking at the swath of ideas that pass through this market. So I actually studied that. And all of the information is out there because the papers are out there. You can read and analyze the papers. And and it's almost kind of, um, it's almost kind of disappointing when you look at some of the, uh, some of the idea classes that just aren't being as successful but are quite interesting. For instance, let me just, as an example, I would use approximate computing. There's this idea that we can allow our computers to get things wrong some of the time uh, for efficiency. Um, And if you develop the right kinds of mechanisms, uh, that can be an an adequate and even preferable way to, a more efficient way to uh, do your computation. This approximation kind of domain It was harder to get papers published if you're working on that for quite some time. But then there's other areas for which 
the market was ready and apt. So in cloud computing, you know, deep learning, uh, yeah. there was a time when all of the deep learning papers were accepted. Um, and so when you observe those two factors, you start to realize that when your papers get rejected, it's, 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 it's not, it doesn't only correspond to the quality of the ideas and the effectiveness of the, of the work itself. It also has to do with the market temperature and the level of rigor at which you executed your work. So mm -hmm. um, I focused on making sure that I could relate every idea to the market. And I always try to encourage all my students to do what I call PLP at three. They should have three distinct stories, research stories that they're working on at the same time, because I've seen many students get discouraged by working on one idea and getting rejected and thinking they're a bad researcher. That's the number one uh, kind of problem, I think, in the way we do things is, is, is people will think that they suck when their papers get rejected, when they may be working on a hard problem, something that's not as sexy. Maybe they're working on memoization, which is an old topic that nobody cares about anymore. Right. So yeah. Um, anyway, anyway, so I developed a number of these things and that 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 accelerated my productivity uh, 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 in, in academic research. I also created my own tools for writing papers. Um, students in my lab know about this thing called FPWSM, Fancy Paper Writing System from Mars. Um, we use that. Actually, all of the first six or seven years of my research was done in this product in this tool that I, I wrote in Python that is a paper writing system that automates almost everything about writing papers. Um, uh, like when it comes to graph generation and organization, it is really interesting. One of these days I'll release it for the world to have. <laughs> anyway, that's how I did it. <laughs> that's incredible. So it's like you built the system for the system in a way. It's like you, you and I like how you also you observe the tree before actually starting to cut it down in a way. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I never yeah, would have yeah. thought that. I never, I always thought just like deep work, focus on one thing, but you, you look at the market and see how can my work also penetrate it? And is it like right. the context of this point in time mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. human history? No, absolutely. Wow. And there, there are topics where everyone would say it's impossible to publish a top tier. For instance, there's something called loop tiling. It's an old compiler technique. There's a paper I have called um, Shapeshifter. It was, it was initially called Universal Tiling. It got rejected when it was called Universal Tiling. But this is an idea that most folks would say, well, at the time that, oh, this is a compiler. It's very niche compiler work. Nobody cares about loop tiling. It's an old idea. Um, but at a top tier venue, I, I, I published Shapeshifter because it's not really about choosing what you work on based on the market, but understanding deeply the, the audience, let's call it the audience. Understanding deeply the audience allows you to understand what it takes to relate your ideas to that audience. So the ideas don't change, but the way you execute your work and the way you frame it and relate it to mm -hmm. that audience, if it's sensitized with the nature of that market, it, it actually, um, you actually, you know, you actually can make more of an impact. Um, yeah, yeah. 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 That's that makes complete sense. And it applies to a lot of what's happening now in the digital age. With yeah. it's like how you say things and how you have it come off because everyone's saying the same thing sometimes. Mm, yeah. The digital age is getting kind of crazy, man. When you look at it from a big picture. I mean, it's 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 becoming um, I don't know. Recently I've discovered, you see. If you really look at, I, I'm actually very, very, I'm somewhat conservative. I'm somewhat conservative. I'm, I'm kind of like very socially compassionate, but I'm, I'm somewhat conservative. I believe in capitalism, free markets, et cetera, a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, of course it, it doesn't solve all problems, but it, it's actually, it, it, I feel like it reflects human nature. It's most accurately, right? Even though we aspire to something that looks more, like a socialist communist kind of situation. I think our nature fundamentally uh, aligns with a more free market kind of system. So that's just to say, I just want to really emphasize that I'm, I'm actually, but I've been recently looking at some of Karl Marx's works and his contributions, really intellectual contributions. 
the guy was a genius. He was a genius, dude. Like, um, you know, understanding the, um, oh, geez, I can't even remember the names, but the means, the means of production and, you know, he, oh, he, he established the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie and, and, you know, um, and like, at least the dynamics of how that works from a economic viewpoint and honestly what we're experiencing today like you mentioned i'll link it back dude you mentioned mm -hmm. the nature of communication and what what's okay how you frame things matter and what's okay to say and not okay to say there's this weird when you take some of that theory that he has and you intermingle it with say social media and the internet and the connectivity of everyone being connected all the time, plus the pressures of, say, a COVID that accelerates the reliance we have on social expression via digital means. When you intermingle those things, we're observing a very fascinating phenomena happen, right? We're observing cancel culture emerge. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, we're observing the realization of this well of power that the masses have. Right. And at the same, and, and that's, that's, the, these point. things just is, I'm not going to attribute it to being good or bad. It just is right. So there's this well of power that is coming from that is ev available to everyone. Mm. At the same time, there is the propensity to, of, of people to align themselves with the truths they prefer. And there's an ability to stay in the realm of the truths that you prefer uh, uh, in this in this new world that we live in, this digital world, so you you get to you get to stay with the truths you like. Yeah, you've got a lot of power collectively, right? And and then you've got the the pressures of the labor versus the owners, the the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie. You've got that kind of deep pressure, which is a thing, right? It, it is a thing manifested in history. Mm -hmm. Like the, the laborers are always dissatisfied with the folks that own stuff, right? The folks who convert their time into resources, into money, there's always a tension with the folks who convert the people into profit, right? Mm -hmm. And owns all the means of production. You know what I mean? So, so that's a Very there cool. plus. So you, then you have cancel culture, then you have justice, like, oh, you know, well, and then you have this power and then you have people, people able to en encircle themselves in the truths they prefer. So we live in a very unique time and we have emerging some interesting societal dynamics from that time that we live in. So I don't know, well, I, I forget what I was driving Yeah, that was, was extreme, at, uh, on, the, on the point of, of how people are framing things and all that, but that was extremely well articulated. Like I, I, it's basically like people are choosing that they want to see what they want to see. Yeah. Kind of like these, uh, these echo yeah. chambers. I have a friend yes. who has a company called the conversationalist and her idea is to have just like more open conversation. But yep. um, on that point too, you, you were big in moving the needle forward in making um, a digital product that can help with tasks that can be automated um like virtual assistants right so like one thing one thing i have here um at university of michigan you were the head of or are the head of clarity lab mm -hmm. correct mm -hmm. okay yep. and pioneered award-winning work in sirius aka lucidia the world's first open source uh, sophisticated virtual assistant that simultaneously hears sees and understands yeah so i remember yeah, you lucidia, on your like yeah. tedx talk you were explaining all that and how it works and demonstrating it you had a demo but um like do you do you see that being of help in making more um i guess i should say like non-judgmental decisions or just like helping out with things yeah 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 i mean it's it's a it's a it's been a wild journey right so so these are tools uh fundamentally yeah. conversational ai and ai in general like they give us um new kinds of tools that we could utilize to make our lives more efficient to make our experiences more convenient right um uh and you know serious like that serious if you if you look back at it serious lucida it, 
it was serious. And then Apple sent us a letter, like change your name, trademark infringement. No it's crazy. Way. Then like we fought it. It's all, I actually discuss it in detail. So I, I, I in my book, right. Um, breaking bots. Uh, Number one bestseller. Dis- yeah. 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 I shockingly, it's a bestseller. I don't know. It's amazing. I don't know. Forbes is good at what they do, but um, I talk about this in, in detail where um, it was called serious and it, uh, Apple reached out with a letter saying that it's too close to Siri. And I was like, what? There's Sirius Radio, Sirius XM, Sirius Black, Sirius is a star system. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> so I tried to um, push back with the university. The university fought with me for a minute. There's a hilarious chapter about this in the book. It's like hilarious. Um, and then, you know, at one point the university was like, you know what? can't do it like i'm t- we're there we're terrified of apple's lawyers um and then we changed the name to lucida but really that project was an academic project where um it was open source creation it was for research and it was for experimentation hobbyists and commercial applications and i was trying to do that in the realm of the university um and that's what that's what springboarded um the entrepreneurial pursuit that became clink uh which is to create a next level um, conversational AI. Um, but these kinds of tools, man, they're, they're tools. And people, people are understanding how to integrate it into uh, their way of life in different ways, right? And I think that we're just at the beginning of this evolution. And we're still figuring many, many things out. It's, it's weird, right? Because you know, you've, got, you've got different classes of things. This is one of those sl- slow moving, world changing things. It's moving slower than many of us anticipated mm-hmm. for, for a host of reasons, but it's not waning. It's gaining, you know, it's gaining momentum. So uh, juxtapose, let's juxtapose it to 3D televisions. Nobody remembers that shit, right? 3D <laughs> televisions was a big deal for a minute, but it died. Yeah. We can juxtapose it to virtual reality, right? Which it hasn't died, but it, it hasn't gained as much traction Mm -hmm. it hasn't grown or ar vr or ar right ar kind of there was pokemon whatever the pokemon yeah and then we haven't heard much yeah yeah yeah. pokemon (laughs) go what was it pokemon go yeah pokemon go yeah so you could just suppose to that but conversational AI is a different beast because every year it's growing and growing People aren't doing it much better as time passes, at least from the experiences we have. But the market for it and the, the amount of research and development that's going into it is increasing. And so many people are doing this studies to see how much it's growing, Gartner and others. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's this weird thing. And really the blocker for it is technology and product. Like it's mm-hmm. tech is the barrier. And so, you know, I always used to say we, we've had Siri for decades now, probably over 10 years. So I can say decades, over 10 years, probably. Yeah. Uh, just about a decade, maybe. Um, and, uh, and the quality of these experiences hasn't really grown as much as we'd expect. And so, but that, I don't think that's because of the science. The science has progressed substantially in that time. I think it's because of the, realization of these technologies into products um, and the the tuning or the the necessary research for how we can apply some of the principles coming out of machine learning and so with clink uh i believe we moved the we moved the 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 technological needle forward substantially and with some of the new stuff i'm working on with jaseki um, and zero shot bot and some of these other technologies, I think we're taking another leap forward. So, wow. so, you know, you really have to drive this kind of innovation by challenging uh, the established means of how we build these things. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how we utilize these technologies to, to address some of the societal problems. Uh, but we're so early that folks are just trying to save costs and monetize things at this moment, um, create sexy features. Um, it's still early uh, to have that kind of impact, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, 
the the way it works the way i see it and the way you talk about it is like it would be great if everyone can have access to this technology but you need to have it be uh, cost efficient first before you can produce it at scale because then if you don't then that company who makes it whatever happens for whoever makes it they'll lose money on it they won't be able to make it at scale but um I wanted to bring up a thing of uh, Clink too. Yeah. So it's amazing that you talked about how research produced all of these papers. Like it was just an environment to have you learn and discover. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Clarity Lab and U of M was like this vehicle to literally launching uh, a company that could help other companies. So I wanted to ask how you said this one point of with scale comes structure. So maybe Mm -hmm. you can maybe get some context on the company and some of the journey early on. So then I can ask the question, uh, some more deeply uh, objective questions to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 2015, right. So, uh, in, as an academic, you know, I, I, we were, our lab was publishing a lot of really quality work and the pinnacle of that work for, for a professor, for an academician is getting the top tier papers, winning awards, you know, being inducted into hall of fames and stuff like that. Um, and it's a little community and, and you'll have all of these professors that are trying to have impact, which means that we go and we evangelize our research to companies like, you know, Google or Amazon or you know, Facebook or whoever is out there. We try to say, you should use our research. Our, the results of our research should impact how you do things. And so professor will go give talks at these, at these institutions and say, please, please use our stuff. It can change your, it makes you better. And then some things get picked up, some things don't. Like 10%, 5% of everything ends up being implemented in a way that society experiences a technology, 95% doesn't, right? Mm. Um, and so, you know, my, my mission is to, is to create benefit for this world, right? Like I want it to have an impact and I also want it to create, you know, great outcomes for the group, right? The students really realizing the, the biggest impact, right? So starry-eyed, th- there's a ceiling to how much of that you can do as purely as in academia. You have to take your creations into industry if you want to have that impact. It's a lot like pharmaceuticals, right? Like if I come up with a cancer drug, I gotta, it's gotta become a sold product either by Pfizer or my pharmaceutical startup mm-hmm. before people can take the drug and then it heals them. So the same with technology, right? You gotta commercialize it for it to have the impact on the world. And so Clink was, um, was that journey. Uh, so I started Clink with a couple of grad students um, and a colleague, Ling Jia Tang, another professor at the University of Michigan, also happens to be my wife. And Clink was, Clink was a rocket ship, um, you know. Yeah, it's like sixty uh, million. Dollars. Yeah, yeah. Like every year we were raising around. So yeah. first we raised two hundred and fifty k, then uh, then we raised uh, six point five million, then we raised fifty three million, and this is like year after year. So it, it grew incredibly fast. And what matters even most is the technology we created was able to uh, penetrate the actual market. People were uptaking it. We had 20 something million users mm. of our tech and we were, we were beating out the incumbents in the space, like the Googles of the world with their dialogue flow, as well as the IP softs and nuances with their products, right? Conversational AI products. Yeah, We were actually winning. Uh, and so that was a, a, a crazy journey and it was incredibly you know, the, 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 the way that I led that company, we had to do some um, against the grain stuff, right? We had to focus on, you know, I, I had this principle called show, don't tell, which is, you know, while the first investors we had was encouraging us to uh, sign uh, letters of intents and show that customers want it before we built anything, you know, I had to say, no, we're going to stall that and we're going to build something amazing. And so then we architected and built one of the most sophisticated virtual assistants yet that I've even seen called Feeny and so forth. And so it was a, 
and and it was a big splash in the market because you could see it and it was very different. Uh, this is described in detail um, in Breaking Bots uh, mm-hmm. in, in the book. Um, so, so it was a crazy success because we demonstrated the the value and the creation all along the way, and it was obvious that it was uh, very different. Um, and so that was an incredible journey. We grew it from zero people. Um, yeah, just me, uh, wow. then me and a couple grad students, then me and then it was 130 people. Um, and, but yeah, anyway, you know, it was a jubilant, um, creation in the market and we demonstrated, uh, a shift in a progress, uh, in technology, uh, on one of the hardest problems in the world, right? Apple, Google, Amazon, Microsoft have all been investing heavily in conversational AI and we've been able to to do something special there uh, and then beat those kinds of folks out of, um, out in the market, right? It's incredible, yeah. seriously, that, that's, that's astounding. And was the product an integration into other uh, messaging platforms or was just its own standalone platform people use for conversational AI? Yeah, it was, it's, it's its own entire ecosystem disconnected from any other dependencies to any other technology. So the entire stack was built in-house. You know, I, I remember, you know, uh, like after architecting it, um, you know, I brought on some of the best engineers to, to build it out. Um, and it was all, it was all novel tech. We have 30 patents, uh, you know, Clink, Clink created 30 patents um, on that journey. And so it was really research, research turned into product. And in a way where at the same time as research was being turned into product, it was winning in the market right which is Mm. is a rare thing you know yeah yeah that's i mean yeah for the valuation you guys got ended up being like 100 to 500 million like the the market kind of was like yeah you're you're you bring this value to us so this is what you're getting monetarily which shows how important you are but yeah that's incredible i didn't i didn't know some of those things i'm also going to make sure i put the uh link to the amazon page for the book uh, in the description because it seems like a lot of the journey is laid with oh it. the book chronicles the whole <laughs> zero to you know the the whole zero to a yeah. hundred of um the company really uh peaking uh in the market and so you know there's a chapter chapter four that talks about um how do you how do you organizationally create an engine that is a research engine with a product expression. It's like, Mm. we're not expressing our research through papers. We're expressing our research through impact in product. And how do you organize that institution? And how do you build that culture where you can operationalize a research program so such that the output is impact in market? Um, And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And And the point I brought up really early before was with scale comes structure. So I know you you said chapter four, it's in the book, but would you just say that it's building a a strong team with not too many constraints so that people can just create? This is a very fascinating (laughs) topic area, actually. And this is a beautiful thing about- But something you can talk on, talk on really well. This is a- this is an interesting science, art and science, right? And uh, so, man, how do we pick this one apart, right? This is this is uh, how do you build, how do you sh- how do you build a structure? I mean, a, a company is an organism, mm. and it's an organism of people. The cells of a company are people, and they're all working together to create goodness for the entire organism, right? It's a collective. Now, there's actually hierarchies in that thing, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, with scale. And this was, man, there's so many learnings on this journey, right? This was my first company. You know, I was fresh out of grad school into professorship, did that for a couple of years and still doing it (laughs) after a couple of years of doing it, started first company in just three years, companies, 130 people. You know what I mean? So 
Incredible. So there's a lot of uh, perspectives and, and cultures and, and philosophies as to how do you organize this organism. And it's a very complicated thing because you want to give folks maximal freedom and maximal voice. That was actually, mm -hmm. I mean, the philosophy that I always ran was let the best ideas win. Doesn't matter if it comes from the janitor, right? Ignore the hierarchy. Everyone, everyone has a voice. Everyone can share. And let's have a culture of respecting not who an idea comes from, not giving credence to who, but giving credence to what the idea is. That way, the organism collectively can let the best ideas from that large thing uh, bubble to the top. So, so we had a lot of, and this was, this was good at a certain size, right? But after about 20 people or so, it's difficult for that to scale because people will have a lot of ideas about everything, yeah. uh, including things for which they have less perspective. Let me give you an example. These com a company is organized into many departments, let's say, right? You have your engineers, you have your salespeople, you've got customer success, you've got quality, quality folks, you've got operational folks, you've got, you know, the financial, you know, the management, you have all these different groups in a, in a, in a company organism. And like, if your engineers are looking at the salespeople, engineers have a lot of perspective on the product and the design of the code or, you know, what they're building. Salespeople have a lot of perspective on what does the market say about this product, right? And most people don't, don't really deeply appreciate the scope of their perspective, right? Most people don't like, for instance, You'll, you'll go on the street and you'll hear someone say, man, Trump was the worst president America ever had. And they will be certain. Of it. And they will think they have sufficient perspective to make that assertion, to make that judgment call. They won't, people don't naturally not trust themselves, what they think, mistrust what they think. They're usually certain of what they think. But if you ask someone else, like if you ask, I don't know, Obama about Trump, you may get something much more nuanced and caveat, right? Because Obama has a different perspective because he's seen different stuff than say your layman, you know, like your layman probably yeah, yeah. hasn't, hasn't even created policy for, I don't know, a, a small company versus mm. the country, right? And, 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 you know, they may not have led like more than three people, but they will be certain that Trump is not a good leader. And so, so, that's, that's a perspective thing. And I really what I'm trying to highlight there is, is folks will feel as though their perspective, their, their judgments are complete from the, from the, you know, from the viewpoint of they have sufficient perspective to produce a, a durable judgment. Mm. Right. Um, and so we have that in organizations too. So Blind when you create fire. a culture where everyone has a voice, linking it back, when you create a culture where everyone has a voice, which sounds like a wholly good thing, which is what we did at Click, and everyone gets to let the best ideas win, the problem is people with less perspective will think they have the best idea, and people with more perspective will think they have the best idea. Salespeople will think engineers are doing something, should be doing something different with limited perspective, engineers would think salespeople should be doing something different with limited perspective. So then you start to create as you scale. You see, when you're small enough, it's easy to share perspectives. If you're 10 people, you just talk for a while and everybody can kind of see the same picture. But when you're 20, 30, 40, 50 people, the ability for individuals to get the sufficient perspective to make durable judgments declines. And so you have to organize a little differently. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have to create more structure in that organization, which is you have to establish an idea of the roles and the scopes of people's work. And then you have to manage that people are focused on that scope with the right evaluation criteria and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. performance evaluations. Performance evaluation serves a very important role in the psychology of people because. It lets people know how, what good looks like or what's the direction of success. And you have to like, you have to lay that out at a certain scale. It's intuitive when you're 
a small, when you're five, 10 people, everybody knows what success looks like. It's like, you know, everything about the company. Yeah. Yeah. Hit this number. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But when you're larger, you, the information becomes more opaque to the individual and <clears throat> you need to have a, a process around this is what different folks does and this is what success looks like for each person. If you don't have that, which we didn't at Clink for a long time, you'll see things unraveling because people will, will assume mm. that they should, they should uh, spread their attention to everything going on uh, and they'll also be at the disadvantage of less perspective. So their judgments are less durable, but they believe their judgments as much as the random person saying Trump was the first president in the United States. Dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. like most people haven't been alive for most of the presidents of the United States. How, how do we know who the worst president is, right? Like, and yeah. that's not to say I'm a big, I, I'm not actually a, a Trump apologist. Uh, I'm actually, I just, I just, I just, I just uh, observe these same trends happening uh, everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, of this kind of um, presumption of credibility of one's own perspective, perspective and judgments. Uh, anyway, so so that needs to be. You need to create engines that are are resilient to some of that, some of those natural things that happens in humans. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, that's, that scale requires structure, right? So as you get bigger with people, with the organism, you have to have more structure. Mm. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a, just a ton of those kinds of mistakes that I think ultimately harmed uh, Clink. The, the, the naive mistakes that, mm. um, you know, leadership was responsible for some of the naivety. Yeah. 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 And like, and, first time building a company to that point but such amazing lessons as we talked about in like pre-discussion like pain plus reflection equals progress mm -hmm. whereas in hindsight you're much smarter now and mm -hmm. or more aware now but yeah. also when i hear the point like with scale comes structure i know what you mean especially after you say it but a lot of people might think like structure rigor not a lot of movement like not a lot of freedom but in what you said, it's more so like these processes or these like evaluations and layers to make sure nothing goes past where like ego can flood through or like assumptions right. can be made. Cause when that's happened, then the communication is thrown off completely. Right. Um, right. But it makes complete, it'll actually, once you do that, it allows for even more openness and uh, creativity. Yeah. Yeah. Within the bounds no, that, of position. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's when you're dealing with i think the i think the the most interesting thing is um is understanding that when you're dealing with people there's a there's a lot of dynamics to the way that we work and we think that comes at play right um you know and 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 then there's hierarchies that have to be acknowledged and respected, you know, we both from the folks, even, even at the folks at the top, higher end of that hierarchy has to respect the hierarchy in a very sensitive way. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, a lot of the challenges Clink, like, so Clink is having challenges now, especially I think since the, the people in the company are very different now, right? Than uh, uh, when I was there, right? Um, and so there's a number, there's a lot of challenges uh, uh, roped up in, into that transition. And, you know, the challenges does not come from the quality of the tech or the quality of the product or the quality, you know, the, the market, product market fit. It's not coming from a problem with what you would think a company is all about. The problem comes from, um, it comes from the way it's the way it, it's organized, and and I think mistakes made in that in the not not evolving quickly enough in tandem with size, right? Not not learning mm. what what changes are necessary at different phases of this growth journey, mm. right? And so uh, 
And so that that's too bad, right? Because it's a it's a it's a beautiful creation, and it, it I'm 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 grateful that it's had the impact it's had, and it has demonstrated something quite novel in the market and created incredible value for so many people. I'm I'm happy about that, but there is this kind of um, there is this kind of tragedy also, uh, you know, to to uh, it not realizing potential that was still on the table, right? It not realizing some of that that potential. So mm -hmm. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's it's a, <laughs> for 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 what has been built. There's so much uh, insight and learning from. I hope people really take away not mm -hmm. only just one thing, but but a couple of things from that in particular. I uh, I want to be cognizant of your time. So I want to be, um, I want to ask the right question. Yeah. The last, go for like, it. basically last question in a way, but, um, I would love to know, cause you said you're working on new things. Yeah. What, what you're looking forward to within the next couple of years with all of this new knowledge, all of this gain skill, like for, for what's being built now totally. what's to come, Yeah. the, the market, how it's evolving even more. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. And, so, you know, so the first thing I did after Clink was the, the book, right? Because I thought there was a lot of special insights in that. So, so we pushed that out. That's good. But the, I, can't, I can't understate the wealth of new perspective. So as an academician, doing a lot of top-notch research and understanding how uh, novel science and ideas and innovations come, come to being, I did that for many years as a professor. Uh, the five years at Clink was being in the field, being in the market, being in the world. Mm. And there's incredible amounts of perspective that's built from that, both on, of course, on, you know, building big companies, that's one. But even from a technology standpoint, be, uh, being able to be close to the blockers, the challenges, the real the real implications of this kind of artificial intelligence in the world to help people. And when, if, I, you know, basically what I'm doing now is I'm taking the wealth of all of that perspective, right? Both the academic and the industry or the commercial, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial, right? Mm. Uh, and I'm, I'm focused on building uh, the most sophisticated uh, AI engine ecosystem paradigm, uh, you know, in that, in considering those insights. And so there's a new programming language that I've been working on for quite some time now. Uh, and that's a programming language to help you articulate solutions um, in a paradigm called Jaseki. The programming language is called Jack. There's a paradigm for computation. There's a computational model that's quite different than anything I've seen before uh, and I believe is out there. Um, and you can articulate solutions to sophisticated problems with this AI computational model plus language. And there's three products that are built on those. So it's three distinct, each product is wrapped in its own company. It's like Alphabet, right? So it's mm. one of those kinds of corporate structures where you have Alphabet, then you have Google and this and YouTube yeah. and that and all that. But so, so, so there's three products and all three of those products are, are live today with users and, and they represent a new generation of what's possible when it comes to improving our lives with artificial intelligence in three different categories, right? There's one conversational AI thing, there's a productivity thing, and then there's a new kind of channel for digital engagement thing, right? Mm. Um, to compete with websites and social media and our thing, right? Um, so there's three incredibly disruptive products that are in market now, invite mm. only still, early access invite only, built on this Jaseki. So if you go to jaseki.org, you can get a bird's eye view into those three products. And I believe that this engine, this computational model, this new technology stack is going to fuel a generation of new kinds of AI products um, and new kinds of computer science solutions to big problems. 
Uh, and so I'm really keen on that. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually in the wild now. Um, and I'm working on a book for that. Um, that's going to be released soon. I'm building, uh, there's a community of developers that are engaged with this Jaseki ecosystem. Uh, and so I'm putting a lot of my energy into that these days. Um, and I'm doing it just, you know, I'm, I'm motivated by creating something beautiful that mm -hmm. can help people. Um, I'm not motivated by money or success or glory. I, I've, I've, I'm completely past that, right? Like I've, I'm so, yeah. I've, I've been so, you know, I've learned so much about the world and life that that's not interesting anymore. What's interesting is creating something beautiful that helps people. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the current journey. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And to be able to release that many products and what time span has that been? In building Jaseki and then all of these three products. Yeah, it's been about a year and a half now. Wow. Um, so, and you know, yes. yeah, I, I kind of, I get enthralled in my work. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I mean, it's <laughs> talking about patterns. I know we geeked out about this in pre-conversation, and now seeing it in the conversation now, it's like seeing these themes and, and pattern recognizing what is happening in the market or even your own life. It's like you did it before with researching yeah. right the yeah. papers and now it's like yeah. no different no different oh yeah, yeah, so yeah you really are com you're, yeah you're combining all of the academia in five years and now being in the in the field and yeah amazing i'm, I'm gonna yeah. i'm also gonna link that i'll probably do look at it after the conversation as well oh cool, cool. um yeah that's amazing it's really great yeah to hear. no no yeah thank you man i mean it's, i'm just dude i'm still quite early in my career right and yeah. so um and so it's a journey, you know, uh, and that's, that's, a, you know, you develop these things um, over the arc of, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> a long time. So, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, you know, to discover some new, some cool new stuff and, and, uh, and be able to bring joy and goodness to, to everyone, you know, that, yeah, that's yeah. actually what was almost to a fault, man. My wife is like, dude, <clears throat> you know why do you care so much about all the people in the world people are crazy <laughs> you know what I mean and I'm like I don't know it's just stitched into like my DNA man like I, I don't know it's that's just what motivates me man creating beautiful things to that that can benefit others I don't know I yeah. love that yeah it's important work and yeah. uh if, if people were to follow you or get best access to you do you think um uh, I mean, you have your website, which I'll link, but maybe Twitter, or what other platforms? Yeah, yeah. LinkedIn is, is a common uh, thing, but you can just email me. That's yeah. good. You know, like um, I got all my emails are out there in the interwebs. You know, you could hit me up on LinkedIn if you want me to share share an email address or something. Um, I, I'm, I'd be delighted to engage with anyone who you know, who's interested or curious or just wants to chat. That's, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, which I'm so glad I, the best conversations when they go an hour or two hours, but feel like 10 minutes, that's when, you know, you did it right. So I appreciate it. Seriously. Oh, anytime. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. It's been great chatting with you and we'll chat again soon. I'm, I'm sure. Absolutely. Sounds good. Awesome.